Uh, first thing to get uh, our character to 17, well, you change the level to 17. Then we go to 17 hit die. Now, we're going to get extra hit points as well. Um, and that is... Uh, well, actually, the hit points we're going to come back to. Well, no, we, we can't increase our, our constitution just yet uh, with a barbarian. And I will show you why. Um, we don't get to be the super strong um, 24 strength until level 20 there, so... Um, so actually, uh, she's gonna have max hit points uh, right out, right out the gate here, uh, from this capped out at twenty. So this is gonna be plus three levels times seven. That seven is half plus one of her hit die, which is twelve, and then we're gonna get three more levels of five hit points because our constitution modifier is five. So we're adding 21, and we're adding 15. So we're adding 36. So this is 209, 209 hit points at level 17. Along the way at level 16, we are going to get another ability score improvement. In that process, we rolled, though, uh, for this character, we rolled that all of her ASIs are going to be feats. She rolled, she rolled in this max range. So we're probably not changing any stats unless uh, there's nothing really to round up. Since everything is as even. So we're going to bust out our player's handbooks quickly. boop -a doop Go to chapter 6. Now, feats are considered options. Optional play rules in 5th edition. You do not have to play with them. You might have a DM that says no feats. It is possible. Now, she already has... Um, oh, wait. Was it this one that had it? Or was it... Um, Which one had all the feats? Or was it... Oh, you know what? Maybe it was Arma. Our monk that had it, because there's four. And I, you know what? We might not have had feats on, on the others. Now, you know what? That makes sense, because how else would we have gotten to a, a, a such a high constitution? Never mind. Disregard me. So we're going to get another ASI, another stat bump. We're going to add two points to something. So actually, um, we can probably bring her strength up. Yes. <laughs> and hey, Santa. Uh, good morning to you. Bonjour. His name is Xylus the Great Arch Lich King, or so he calls himself. Um, he just feeds the souls of divine children to increase his lifespan. Eh, the, the huge, the huge. That, uh, you know, that that's that's bread and butter procedure, Cedric. So yeah, no surprises there. Yes, it is Santa. So yeah, you know what? Let's drop. Let's drop this stat bump that we would get at 16 into strength and bring that to an 18. So that's 4. This is going to be 9. And 9. That's going to bring our strength up. And it is also going to increase our... Boop -a -doop -a -doop -boo. Yeah, look at that. We go from 5 to, to a proficiency of 6. So we're going to adjust a couple things here and there. 
There we go. There we are. Uh, lingering magic is based off of con, so we have to do that five times per long rest in order to sort of burst with color in the presence of magic. And... Uh, we get Persistent Rage and Brutal Critical. And there we go. I guess here, if we want to keep it three dice, it just means we're rolling four. Uh, before it was like we're rolling three, because you're instead of you're rolling two, because uh, a crit, you know, doubles the damage dice. But there we go. Excellent. Now, we go to our other barbarian that we created. We're going to bring her up to level 17. Oh, gnomes are small. S-M-O-L. We get 17 D12 hit die. This is also going to allow us to pump something else up. You know what? I want to increase her dexterity to 18. And her proficiency goes to 6. So this is going to change these saves. Her initiative is going to go up because that's a dex check. That is 2 plus 6 is 8. 8 and 6. Our DC is still going to be a 17 because we haven't changed our constitution. Initiative has changed. We are going to get Persistent Rage. And our Brutal Critical is 3 times the dice. Very good. I mean, I can Eldric Blast uh, with an average cost of, in a distorted deponic tone, my soul, and in, and in eternal misery after death. Back to normal. A pretty fair price, I'd say. Also free dental. Well, heck yeah. Sounds like your boss knows how to get people working for him. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's true. It, it does go up because your proficiency bonus is baked into it. Thank you for that catch, uh, Cold Spark. Uh, da -da -da -da. what else? What else? Oh, our hit points now. We have three more levels. So three times seven, that's half plus one of our, our D12 hit die. And then we get three levels of our constitution uh, modifier. And so we have 21 and... It's inverse of 12, so this is going to be 33. That's going to go to 62, 192 hit points at level 17, which is epic level. Congratulations. If you are level 17, you are an epic level character in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. 17 through 20 are your epic levels. You are the, the absolute like tip-top 1% of the world. Who could ever hope to be this powerful or, or influential? And, oh, you know what? I'm sorry. Our rage damage goes up by one also. Uh, and our number of rages per day. Uh, how dare me? How dare me? Plus four rage damage. And we get to rage six times per day. Plus four rage damage, and we get to rage six times per day. <laughs> mm 
Unless you're a ranger with a short sword, then you do nothing at level 20. Well, it, people get things or, you know, here and there. Some might be more front-loaded and... Yeah. And of course, every game every game is different. All right, and then our our monks are our monks. They're both level seventeen characters. Uh, so now that we have we've brought this up, let's take a look. All right, we, we used our random character generator, and by the way, if any of you want to take a look at this content. It is available for free, all legal beagle-like, right here from wizards themselves. Let's use this worksheet that I've developed as a way to now, now that we have our four members of our party, what does the party look like as a character sheet? That Eldritch Blast, though, Cedric. Saw something possibly cursed today. Uh, Vitamina de avocado carbonated. An avocado smoothie soda. Really depends on how fresh the avocado is, I guess. Sort of like an avocado Julius. Interesting. I mean, really, that, that just seems like it would be a guacamole. Because, uh, I, I mean, how thin can you get an avocado? Uh, you know, avocado guts. Now this is one way that I propose you could you as a party as a player or a DM can take everyone's character sheets and and let's take a look at them. Let's compare and contrast. And there's a reason for us to do this that we understand a group identity to see connections um in to also pardon me provide our dungeon master with some really interesting some really interesting ways to challenge us. So our first character, you know what? We never gave our first character a name. Uh, let's see. This is the one that we made with uh, Jeremy, a.k.a. Trust a Flump over at D&D &D time. Um... Well, that's more of a position than a name. We were also talking about... We're kind of making a joke because of the, the schools of magic. Enchantment is missing off the list. And so if uh, barbarians can't be enchanting, we the one that took its place, we were laughing and saying, well, maybe it's the war magic uh, of Cormir. Uh, that's filling in instead. Um, but, uh, what, so Jojo, I mean, Jojo might work. It's more of a play on the monks, though, than on the, on the barbarians. As it's the, it's the monks that grow their stands out of their backs. But we have some prompts, so we, we had, um, we had Jeremy, we did have, uh, we had to talk about a flump, uh, war magic. So if we if we take a look at a couple of these, let's go. Um, uh, Flepany. Flepany. Flepany Water Jar. Why play a JoJo monk when you can play a Dragon Ball monk? Hey, ch oh, and hey, Trust of Flump is here. Yeah, oh, yeah, we didn't give a name to this character that you and I made on stream. And so I was putting up some random name prompts of uh, Jeremy, Flump, and War Magic. And so we needed to create a name for her. And by the way, I leveled him up to 17 so the monks and the barbarians would be on the same level. And so we have Flepany Warjare.
So we have Flepany. Her strength is an 18. Her dexterity is a 10. Her constitution is a 20. Her intelligence is an 8. Her wisdom is a 14. And her charisma is also a 14. Her major save proficiencies are strength and dex. Her passive perception is 12. And her passive investigation... Of, of course, if you want to replace this with anything else, you can. I put up passive investigation since there's a feat that specifically invokes that concept. But if you want passive insight or you want to modify this worksheet in a different way to measure different aspects of your party, please go ahead and do so. This is going to be available like the others on our Discord. Our hit points uh, for Flepany are 209 and her armor class. Now, we didn't give her armor. And so I suppose in fairness, if we're saying no shield, no armor, and we're just going off of unarmored defense, which we'll do for both our monk and our barbarian. So those are our conditions. Her unarmored defense is going to be a 15. Her AC will be 15. Naturally, we can bring that up with a shield. Uh, you know, we can bring that up with... Uh, by wearing other armor, though this is unarmored defense. Um, you know, we in fact we can even come up here and just go unarmored defense right there. Uh, oh, is uh, trust a flump a cleric by any chance? Uh, Cedric, we we have uh, we have an undying warlock here named Cedric uh, who is visiting us and taking a look around. And apparently, Cedric's in need of a cleric. Now, what are what are her skill proficiencies? Athletics, and so we will put Flepany here. As well, we have investigation. Nature. Whoops. Insight. Intimidation. And persuasion. Party languages, aside from common, if you want to replace this with something else, you, you may. Um, we have... Elven. And really, she gets two others. I'm just going to put an X2 since we have uh, these floating languages that we can assign. And, and this is going to summarize a point. I'm not going to make a full spreadsheet about all this stuff. Now, what about tools? Ah. Carpenter's tools. Now, what is her role in the party as a barbarian? She is certainly, and with a great strength and not a lot of dexterity, uh, she is definitely melee. I can argue that because of the nature of this barbarian, she could also qualify to be under light magic. And she is, uh, she's also... She has proficiency in six skills. That's really, really good. And it's my line in the sand, but what I've been doing when we're making these party sheets, if a character is proficient in six or more skills, I call them a, I call them a skilled character because they they're tend to be able to do a lot more than just hit something or cast a spell. Excellent. Now, I'm not going to worry about this other part. We're, we're going to get to that. So now let's take a look at uh, Barina the Feybound. Bound. 
Barina has a strength of 13, a dex of 18, a constitution of 18, an intelligence of 10, a wisdom of 14, and a charisma of 10. The saves are also strength and dex. Passive perception is 12. Our passive investigation is 10. Our hit points at uh, this level are 192. And her unarmored defense is 18. A popcorn ball? Hey, that's awesome, Shukan. Thank you. I'm probably a bard, but I'd like to say I'm a cleric. You could be a bard th that pretends to be a cleric, Trust a Flump. <laughs> you can also cast Eldritch Blast. And you get free dental. Oh, I'm sorry. It's Khan. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm... I... Khan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a derp. I'm a derp. This is this is why I keep you all around. You got to keep me in check. Coming down here, we have some skill proficiencies in stealth. In animal handling. In survival. And in deception. She is bringing Gnomish into the mix. As well as... A gaming set and thieves tools proficiency. Now we're going to come over here and we have a quick summary of Barina. Barina is also a barbarian who can melee and can make uh, ranged attacks with great accuracy as well. So she is melee and she is ranged. She also has a better uh, better unarmored defense than um, a better unarmored... You know what? I was probably thinking for barbarians, uh, it's not proficiency, but it's... Uh, da -da 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 -da. Uh, danger sense. You get advantage on dexterity saving throws uh, against things you can see. Um, so it's it's probably not enough to to have it mean a, in a quasi equivalent of being proficient, but you do get advantage in most circumstances. And and you can always note that here too, if you wanted to put, you know, uh, strength con and make a little, you know. And if you wanted to put dex, question mark, or something along those lines, um, maybe that's what I was thinking of. Because barbarians, if you don't have a rogue to send down the hallway for looking for traps, you send the barbarian down the hallway to set them all off. Yeah, I'm not a cleric, but I do play one on stage. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And hopefully you can see the direction that this is this is going to be taking. All right, now we come over to Arma. By the way, Trustaflump, we ended up rolling into a multi-class last night with our final monk. We are an astral monk slash necromancer. As per the wizard school, not the general concept, because a necromancer in 5th ed could be... A paladin, a bard, a wizard, or a cleric. And I asked chat, should I, do you want me to pineapple pen 
do we, do we want to make an unearthed arcana multi-class? And they said, nah, roll it. And so we rolled it and we got a necromancer. Shukan, you want to give the Valindra shadow mantle you pulled to trust a flump? Very well. It shall be done. Uh, by that, make sure you send me a note about it. <laughs> and you know what, Shukan? Uh, trust a flump. Uh, we we, we got to put a little uh, a little wind in trust a flump sails because that man marathoned the entirety of D and D time last night on on their channel for Friday. Because normally it's a split effort between uh, Pete and Jeremy to run games and to do tech and chat stuff and all that. Um, this this absolute mad lad uh, ran all the games and did it all. I'll, I'll have to catch the VOD. It, you say it's not as long as usual, but uh, I mean, what what is usual? Like a 10-hour session or... <laughs> All right, so Arma, Arma has some ability scores. Did y'all know that? I did. Her strength is eight. Her dexterity is 14. Her constitution is 11. Her intelligence is 16. Her wisdom is 16. And her charisma is 12. And monks get strength dex. Actually, you know what? You know what? Monks get all. Monks are proficient in all. Oh, you know what? This one... <gasps> I went too far. This one won't. Because of the multi-class. Alright, let's go back to Arma, though. Our passive perception is 24. And our passive investigation is 13. Her hit points at level 17 are 88. And her unarmored defense at this level is 15. Now, what about the skills? Which skills is she bringing to the group here? Uh, history. So we have Arma in history. We have Arma in religion. We have Arma in insight. And we have Arma in Perception, Arma in Deception, and Arma in Persuasion. Because uh, she rolled everything. Everything is a uh, is a feat. No, no stat bumps. And by the way, we gave her Mage Slayer. All right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Shukan, uh, you have two boxes coming to you. Uh, thank you so much. Only six hours instead of eight like last time. Well, yeah, hopefully, you, I mean, that two hours was uh, was consumed in, uh, in delightful sleep and you were able to catch up on it. Cedric. Thank you for uh, thank you for showing up and having some fun and role playing. Um, maybe maybe you did manage. Uh, may Lord Xylus bless you all, and uh, and may you continue to channel uh, to channel his eldritch blasts uh, at the at the cost of just a little a little singe of your soul. Uh, but yeah, thank you for coming out, role playing with us, having fun. You are always welcome at our table, Cedric. Um, we're gonna come back on Tuesday actually for role playing, because that's when I present. My role-playing game, and then Wednesday through Saturday, hey, we got some th we got some workshopping to do. Although, Descent into Avernus miniatures are coming out, I think, on Wednesday or Thursday, and we might just take a day to pop open minis. <laughs> all right, so she is all about feats, Ab absolumo. Now, her languages, um, she can actually just speak and understand all languages. Uh, because she has the... She has the, the tongue of sun and moon. Very universal. 
Uh, tools. Another gaming set. So we have two gaming sets in the group. Tinker's tools. Let's see, an instrument and calligrapher's tools. And what roles in the party does Arma play? She is a monk. And she is... She is melee. She is skills. She might be decent at ranged if she wants to use a sling or throw a dart. Hey, GM Vault, and good morning, Grimvex. Welcome. Now, whether or not she is, you know, primarily a ranged, mm, as this style of monk, this style of monk is very hands-on, haha, <laughs> as the astral self. In fact, you get, uh, you get improved uh, range because you have a, a 10-foot reach with your astral arms. Uh, you're kind of like a, a Diclonius from Elf and Lead. Uh, you are deranged, <laughs> says GM Vault. So your reach is certainly less than five feet, huh? All right, and then... We have our final character we made for the party. Uh, it, normally we make a five-character party, though for timing for the week we made two of each. We have Kathir. Kathir has an 11 strength, a 14 dex, a 16 intelligence. Oh, I'm sorry, 8 con. A 16 intelligence. An 18 Wisdom, and a 14 Charisma. Our passive Perception is 14, and our passive Investigation is 13. His hit points at level 17 are 65, and his Unarmored Defense is a 17. And by the way, for the Barbarians, this is not considering a shield. So technically, we could be at 17 and 20, respectively, if we wanted to. Oh, that's... <laughs> come close and I'll just lick you, says GM Vault. <laughs> um, the backgrounds? Well, we've assigned each of the characters a background. So what we're constructing is a character sheet for the party as a whole. Now what about our skill proficiencies? Athletics. Kathir. Acrobatics. Stealth. And deception. So we have no sleight of hand and no arcana, as well as no medicine or performance. We are bringing uh, common and uh, infernal as an extra language. So we're floating two variables off of one character here. Um, uh, Flepany here can learn two other languages. And so we can slot those in, perhaps, to be able to speak to the others in Gnomish. We have two gnomes in the party, after all. Um, or in, in something else. Uh, do we want to go Infernal or Draconic or something along those lines? What would be appropriate? Would it be Sylvan? 
Pardon me. Sylvan, because that, that's her blood, that's her heritage? Possibly. We have that freedom. And I'm going to represent that as a variable here. Tools. We are bringing... Uh, another gaming set. So that is... That's two gaming sets. Actually, three gaming sets. Our party can all play the same game together or be good at three different things. Thieves tools times two. And painter's tools or art supplies in some other fashion. As we were saying that uh, he sketches out layouts of buildings and plans routes and does all this other, other stuff here. But we'll just call it uh, painter's tools. Whoops. Ha <laughs> ha. The party of the party of painting or the language of painting. Which could go very well with our calligrapher by the way. Now Kathir is a monk/wizard. Slash and Kathir is bringing Melee and High Magic. Although, if at this level, if you didn't want to call it High Magic, because it's a it's a splash and you get four, three, and three for spell slots, you could still say that this is either low magic or maybe medium magic. It's up to you. Th this is this is not a hard and fast workshop. That uh, worksheet for our workshop that will absolutely accurately measure 100% of the time every variable of every member of every party that can exist. Now, as we're continuing to get this data, let's make some things let's make some things apparent. Every party in some way, does have a weakness. And you would be doing yourself a disservice if you don't, as a player, understand the weaknesses in the party so that you can roleplay with them, around them, or to try and eventually turn them into a strength. Some DMs may very well... Um, allow you to get extra skill proficiencies if you work towards something or, um, you know, an item might happen that, uh, you know, this is one thing or another uh, will grant you uh, a, a proficiency of some kind. Or you just get wise to the fact that this is just a weak spot and we have to keep our eye on it because there's really nothing else we can do about it. Now, hopefully, you can see what doing this exercise now, now accomplishes, right? So we have each of our characters, and we can look down the line to see where we're strong and where we're weak. We can take a look at not just these stats, and if you want to put others up here, again, other passives or uh, something else that is important to you, go ahead. This is creating a little a little bar graph showing where we are strong. And for having only a four-person party, only a four-person party made up of two barbarians and two monks, I hope you're getting an interesting glimpse at just what kind of coverage you could still have. Part of this workshop is to confront the taboo that just because someone else is playing a barbarian that you cannot play a barbarian and that somehow you won't add something to the group. You absolutely will. Absolutely. Look, we're only missing four skills. And mind you, we didn't sit down and say, well, no one has Arcana, so I guess we're going to give Arcana to Kafir, uh, uh, not Kafir, uh, Kathir. You know, no one has performance, so 
Yeah, I guess we'll just uh, give it to Flepany. It, it, it's not in. It's not a looking back contrivance. Each of these characters were brewed themselves, just as a character, as an individual, not as a part of a party. And yet, look what happened when we have four characters. Two of them are gnomes. Two of them are criminals. Two of them are barbarians. And two of them are uh, monks. And look at the diversity we have going on so far. Yes, old port. Santa, you ran a three-player one-shot the other day. All the players were warlocks, and it was incredibly fun. It, it very much can be. There's so many differences you can have in 5th Ed where a warlock isn't just a warlock like it might have been in other editions. Uh, a warlock is simply one piece of your character. Your character sits atop a stool, and a stool needs at least three legs to be stable. And so in this case, we have your race, your class, and your background. Your background plays a huge part in this. Then if you want to put a fourth leg or more to the stool to offer more support, there's other things that can that can vary it up. Like this, prob this party's probably going to try and rush down and murder everyone before they take damage because the healing isn't really there. And, and yeah, so Old Port, um, hold on to that thought for just uno momento, por favor, because you're absolutely correct, and this is something else that I want to bring up if you're going to do a party examination. Um, if you want to do the same, you know, Elvin would get yellow because you have it, it's there, but yellow is caution. If, if something happened to Flepany, Flepany left the party, got kidnapped or died or wasn't available for this circumstance, the party, the other three members of the party, wouldn't have access to investigation, nature, and whatever. So that's why two turns green. Green is safer, right? Green is safe. You have a backup. If, Fle if Flepany were to go missing, we at least have Arma to do our insights for us. And blue is the sky. You're you're as free as the sky. You're you're uh, safe, sound, and secure, generally. Because if uh, in this case Arma were to disappear, now you have redundancy between Barina and Kathir, meaning you still might even be able to lend aid to each other, and get advantage on something if someone else was missing. And so it's a good it's a good comfortable safety net if you have three or more. And that's why I turn it blue. Plus blue is my favorite color. So whatevs. I'm biased. Well, hopefully, hopefully he didn't die. <laughs> and we can go through, and it, instead, it, you can write all of this out. I only have this on one page to make it more concise for broadcasting. Absolutely nothing would stop you from modifying this and continuing these uh, these sort of bar graphs down the line. Random Hero says purple is the best color. Uh, because it has blue in it, I will partially concede. <laughs> it, well, and Cold Spark is there in purple as well. So, <laughs> um, And we take a look at the rolls. Is this necessary? I mean, it might seem obvious. And yet, when we say barbarian... How do we have... Oh, actually, you know what? I'm sorry. Uh, Barina here is also a low magic character for this being this barbarian. So if I were to tell you, yeah, my party has two barbarians in it. Yeah, it, we have some uh, decent magic coverage. Wait, what? How does that work? If you break down another aspect of the group like this, we have melee covered. And be, because of the nature of this character, we are a low magic character. And many people would just associate Barbarian with melee, but take a look at Barina. Barina absolutely can just use a longbow and snipe all day long, and she'd be delighted. Although, 
she can also uh, put a beat down on someone in uh, in melee combat. Even though her strength is 13, she's more of a dex barb, which is fine. You don't get to max out everything necessarily uh, because of your rage in combat, but your rage is going to do so much more for you elsewhere. And um, it makes for a very interesting character otherwise. You're a green and beige person. Colors are never used all that much. Really livens things up. Yeah, you, you kind of have a uh, like a dusty green look to me, old port. Although, interestingly enough, pardon me. Trust a Flump shows up as bright green in the chat that I'm looking at, and up above in the chat box through slobs, it's orange in color. Green is not a creative color, says Trustaflum. And now we get somewhat to what Old Port Media was indicating. This is where we can use the data that we have illustrated and highlighted and drawn out above and get a conceptual look at who we are as a party. We're making a, a singular party identity from the four basic elements that comprise the party. Your strengths and weaknesses of this SWAT report, S-W-O-T, a SWAT report. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Strengths and weaknesses are internal to your party. They're things that your party just naturally could do. No one really has to go out of their way. It's uh, it's baked right in. You know, if you... Uh, I, I use the little girl selling lemonade example. Um, if you are selling crystal light lemonade in your pitchers... A strength could be that you are selling lemonade with a strong brand name behind it. It's you don't can you don't really control it, but it, it's something that's affiliated with your business. And as you present it to people saying, Oh, cold crystal light here on a hot summer's day, then that that could be a strength. You're using a strong brand. A weakness is something that is intrinsic to the group uh, to the group. If you're a little boy or a little girl running a lemonade stand, one of your weaknesses is a lack of business experience or customer service. Yeah, that is a weakness of yours, especially if this is your first job. And so what you might do is... Someone comes over and spills a cup of your lemonade... And you say, uh, that's going to be 15 cents. Well, if it was an accident, I know it's 15 cents. Now, many other business people may not nickel and dime, or in this case, I guess very literally, a nickel and a dime, uh, to nickel and dime someone over an, an ac a clearly accidental uh, spilled drink of lemonade. That probably cost, what, a penny to make? But the lack of experience is intrinsic to the seller. A zero in... <laughs> the Barbarian wouldn't be uh, doing a whole lot of moving around. GM Vault must be putting like a very rare whiskey shot in every glass of lemonade to charge 72 bucks. <laughs> now, opportunities and threats are external opportunities and threats are external to you they are things that you uh, are primed to exploit should they occur or you, that you must brace for when they occur an opportunity would be summer or living on a on a uh, a heavily uh, or if not living on uh, setting up your lemonade stand on a, a heavy pedestrian walkway so location is an opportunity. 
you may not necessarily be able to control it, or rather, you don't control the number of people who walk by, but many do. And that's, and that's your opportunity to sell lemonade to them, because so many people tend to walk by more quickly. An opportunity is also a beautiful, hot, sunny day. You can't control the weather, but when the weather's nice and hot and sunny and people are walking around, they're probably going to buy your your 15 cent cup of lemonade your crystal light i'm sorry your crystal light lemonade uh you'll have to explain that old port stirred with a unicorn horn and added ice from the crystal clear fjords of flint Paisy says, uh, threat is the small business bureau coming by and asking if you have a license. Yeah, so so um, uh, a, a nosy neighbor reports you to the government. A threat would be someone coming up to a 12-year-old and saying, you can't sell cups of crystal light lemonade because you don't have a permit. A threat would be, I mean, a threat could also be the same neighborhood. Heavy pedestrian. We could be talking, you know, downtown in a busy city. And not every city has the best downtowns. And so the location might have an opportunity. The location might also bear a threat. Is someone going to steal for, you know, money from a kid for selling lemonade on a hot summer's day? A threat could also be this, the same, almost the same weather. You know, like summer weather. We tend to think about beautiful, hot, sunny days. You can get powerful storms. And if you have an outdoor lemonade stand... That's going to be a threat to your business. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So something like super, super high-end like that. Exactly, Old Port. Yeah, Random Hero. You may not be able to control if uh, the kid across the street wants to open up a another lemonade stand and sell his or her lemonade for 14 cents. So those are threats, right? They are... Um. Uh, oh, okay. So that fifteen hundred a bottle A H Hirsch Reserve isn't worth it. However, Pappy Van Winkle is worth it. And how much does a Pappy Van Winkle go for then, Old Port? And and now that we've discussed what goes into a SWAT report, these are generally business, uh, like business terms, business thinking. Though you, I hope you can see you can apply it to D and D and a lot of other things in life. Going back up to uh, up to this, boop a doo. Eh, that wasn't really productive. Let's do this, and eh, I was really hoping that it would stack the other page on the under the side. I'm not sure how to go about forcing that to happen, at least not right offhand. Anyway, so now that we have this, it's all big and in front of us. What? To you all out there, what are some strengths of the party? Right? These are things that are internal to the party. What are some strengths of the party? And I'll prime this by saying... Physical saves. How about that? Strength con, strength con, strength dex, everything. We're very good with physical saves. Now I want a role-play game in a fantasy world where adventurers get licensed for specific types of adventures in specific locations, like a driving license. Your party has two floor mines uh, in forest regions, but you can't tackle that fourth floor tomb until you complete the training course and upgrade the license. That, um, da -da 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 -da, I think that's kind of how things work in, uh, in Goblin Hunter. You have to be a certain low, uh, like recognized adventurer a certain tier adventurer uh to be able to go beyond oh also uh made in abyss has something similar to that too two to eight hundred dollars depending on how old it is new ones are cheap but hard to get and you gotta wait on them Ooh. and yet i bet i bet somewhere out there out in las vegas land there's a room with tens of thousands of dollars of a couple bottles of whiskey or a wine or uh, some things like that. 
just stashed away, waiting for that one high roller to come through. Any other strengths uh, out there that you see? Here's another... Uh, I'm, I'm kind of going for a low-hanging fruit here. Melee. We're excellent in a close fight. We're absolutely excellent in a close fight. I'll have to look those up. I like the notion of an office worker telling a barbarian he doesn't have the permission to save someone. <laughs> Conan the Librarian. Now, you could individually list deception. That That is a strength for sure. Internal to the party, we have three people here. If you want to be more broad, and that's up to you, this is a very skilled, especially if we're only having four members in the party, we are very skilled. <clears throat> Taking a look here. Dexterity certainly is a, uh, a strength for us. And wisdom seems to be as well. That being said... Mm, I mean, we're, we're mildly charismatic... Our intelligence, I mean, look, our, our we have very intelligent monks, by the way. And, and it's kind of a feast or famine when it comes to, when it comes to, uh, constitution. Yet we have a 13, 8, 11 for strength because one of our barbarians dared to break out of the mold and become a uh, dex barb. And so, interestingly enough, I... For a party like this, weaknesses could probably argue that uh, strength and con are going to be major weaknesses, especially because these are the ones that have eights. None of the other abilities have an eight in them. Oh, I'm sorry, int. Uh, we did have one, one int dump there. Now, if you want to just take the average and add up the average, that's fine as well. Time for a shower and off to bed. Have a great night, GM Vault. Thank you for stopping by and having fun with us. Uh, Paisy, we made two of the uh, the, the Unearthed Arcana, the new uh, Wild Soul Path Barbarians, and we made two of the Astral Self Monks. However, the second one is an Astral Monk slash uh, Necromancy Wizard. Our weaknesses seem very glaring up here with the, the, the big red stripe. Um, however, because we have a lot of... A, a weakness is um, many skills only have one person proficient in them. Which could be a threat if that person were to be removed or not available. Um, skills spread too thinly. And so up here we'll put uh, broad skill base. So it's good that we have coverage. The weakness, however, is beyond the glaring four where we have none, no coverage. Our skills are spread too thinly. Weaknesses? No intrinsic healing there's no one who's a healer now our necromancer can heal himself with his spells that doesn't really make him a healer though
And similarly, we can put uh, no strong magic force. I don't see a healer's limited health recovery for longer missions. So yeah, Paisy, this is... If we're making a general SWAT, what this could mean then, if if we're making this as a party, we know that, you know, maybe maybe this is more of just a get in, get out. We're good. This party's awesome for a series of one shots. Now our dungeon master might have thought otherwise and said, uh, let's see. Yeah, I've been working on this sort of, you know, Lord of the Rings style epic two year long milestone campaign. And, uh, you know, we're going to start with this, you know, really brutal fight. Everyone's just going to start at half health. And and then suddenly the party comes to you and says, all right, hey, we've done this sheet. Uh, take a look. What do you see? Ooh. Uh, we might have to change up a couple things. <laughs> and you can always bring up stuff like the languages, party tools. We're pretty good at, uh, at getting into places and having fun. Uh, we can also build some things and repair others. I think we're really good on, on the types of tools that we have. Pool proficiencies. Now, how about this? What is an opportunity to this party? What is an opportunity? And you know what, Paisy? You could even say in a meta sense. We don't even have to just go off of what is said here directly. We can we can extrapolate. We can extrapolate ideas. An opportunity for the party, in your opinion might just be one shots uh one shots or brief missions you watch a session of strahd oh um i hope that everyone was having fun while i a uh, strahd's a very intense module it could lead to more interest on the monetary side constrained resources since you need potions to fill your uh yes 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 Assassinations. You know what? We do have a Mage Slayer in the group. Um, our, our pure Astral Monk is a Mage Slayer. And our Barbarians can certainly take the hits. And our Monks can avoid the hits. Uh, they can't hit point tank it, but they can either dodge them or just mitigate things. Right, thieves tools to break in the places to gather things up. We do have a blackmailer in the party. And by the way, this is something else that's not reflected in this. Th this is meant to get the idea across. We have two criminals. We have a highwayman and we have a blackmailer. These are things that can also be considered because we have two criminals. Because we have Here we go. Right, we have a shipwright who is a guild artist. And by the way, we have a shipwright. We could we could have some high seas adventure or some riverboat adventure. We have a guild artisan, two criminals, and a knight, which is a derivative of the noble subclass or uh, the noble background. And by the way, she is very ambitious. She is uh, and so she is happy to do things like assassinations to uh, in order to get ahead. And have, uh, and have it be so that she gives orders to people, and people stop giving her orders instead. Oh, okay. Uh, well, it... <laughs> um, one of those things happened when I ran it. I'll let you guess which one happened first. All right, Maddie, your turn to keep me awake. Uh oh. Do you have a log? Uh, it says a yawn. There's my war cry. We're not. We're not sleepy. We're not tired. That's our war cry. Rawr. Uh, I hope you had a good day. All the same, Mazamune.
setting up a business front, extortion. We have a blackmailer, someone who's ambitious, is looking to get ahead. You know, she's neutral evil. Barina's chaotic evil. Now remember, evil doesn't mean you have to kill puppies and burn down orphanages. Um, it just means you're selfish. You're very you're self first. You you tend to be more ambitious than not um, when it comes to getting your goals accomplished before others or at the expense of others. Uh, an opportunity would be to work amongst the gnomes, or or really, um, anything fey. We have two gnomes, and we have a half-elf. Now, half-elves have a mechanical fey ancestry trait. Gnomes don't, comma, but many consider gnomes to be a fey, anc uh, fey ancestry. And when we have a barbarian that effectively has a pact with an archfey... Well... Anything Fey might offer an opportunity for uh, contacts, for exploration, trade. Perhaps opportunities for the DM to design a high-intensity, uh, semi-improvised criminal campaign focused on short, intense bursts of actions, combat and social, rather than the more slow-paced and planned good guy story. Paisy, we are absolutely allowed to think in the meta. If we're sitting down with our players and we're having, in this case, it would be a five-person... Session zero? Maybe a, you know, I'd say a point five, but that's higher than zero. You get what I'm saying? And we sit down and say, all right, well, I'm the DM. You love these characters, everyone. You brought me these characters. We even, you know, I even allowed for a consideration on something. Um, have fun. Let, let's do this. This is going to let me sit back now because we're discussing things in the meta and go, oh. All right, so we're not playing, we're not effectively recreating uh, Lord of the Rings. I had this long story uh, out there. Oh, it was going to go you know, traverse hundreds of miles, see all these people. But the party, you know, I want to play with my friends and, and our happiness together is very important and I draw my happiness from theirs. I might need to switch some stuff up. And I wouldn't have known that unless we went through this exercise. And yeah, you have someone you have someone as a blackmailer that might even have dirt on an apothecary, an alchemist, a healer, you know, a doctor of some kind, um, who when you when you return back might be willing to um you know, hook you up with some healing. Just, you know, don't tell my patients that whatever. No plan survives first contact with the enemy. Oh, I mean the, the players. A plan is a list of things that can go wrong. If you approach making a plan like that, you can be successful. Just bear in mind, a plan is a list of things that can go wrong. Now, what about a threat? What is, what is an external threat to this group? Hmm. Hum. Hmm. Illusionists. You know, our our at least our passive investigation isn't very high. Traps. You know, do we have we do have one lookout monkey here. You know, who can kind of scamper around and go, whoa, ha, ha, and point to, you know, point to the trap. We have, But we have people who can, you know, maybe address the trap, sure. Uh, very good at mitigating the trap once it's been set off. But take a look. Uh, we don't have a lot of very strong intelligence uh, saving throw modifiers. And in that case, because I believe most illusions require uh, require intelligence... We can simply put illusions, or illusionists, if you prefer. Take a look at the encounters. 
if you're a dungeon master and you are presenting a challenging encounter to this group, who? You the, balancing this would be very interesting, right? Because the if you make them too weak, the barbarians are just gonna roll over them. If you make them too strong, then they're gonna destroy the much by by a hundred or greater the much larger, or they're gonna destroy the much smaller monks. Yeah, I mean they're dancing around with a fifteen and a seventeen AC. Not terrible. They have evasion. Though, look at the encounter that would happen here. You have to eat the hit points. Somehow. Ranged fighters could be a threat as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ranged attacks. Kobolds would hurt them long term. Ooh. If the short boys were smart about it. Ah, through their pack tactics. A threat would be also something that is perhaps a distance off. Not that, you know, uh, Flepany or uh, Kethir don't have ranged uh, options, especially, look, as a wizard, you're, you know, you have cantrips and such. Though we really have one dedicated person who might be an archer or a dart thrower. This group can death spiral very easily. You're absolutely correct. No intrinsic healer. Um... You know, you got to bring your potions in with you, refill before every strike. Um, and it, and then how would you go about designing an encounter that would be thrilling and challenging for the barbarians and the, the druids alike without either... Um, hmm. Uh, all right, well, no way to remove curses. At least that's intrinsic to the, the, the party. Now, with that being said, in a roleplay sense, in a roleplay sense, we have this noble and we have a blackmailer. Both of them probably know people. In fact, some of the people might even cross over in each of their professions here. And so there, uh, a threat... Um, and a threat would be a reliance on... Outsiders supporting them. Uh, in their efforts. So there could be something that moves very quickly. If, if something else is moving quickly other than this party. Um, ooh. I mean, that definitely would be a threat, but we have monks and barbarians. I don't know how much more uh, speedily you'd want them to move. <laughs> But do you get the idea here, then? Ways that you can look from purely internal mechanics to... Let's take a step back. This this group... I, I love my character. You all seem to like yours. Let's pretend we're, we're players here. I just don't know if we have what it would take for a kind of marathon session, long, epic storytelling. And so you, we're going to have to tell the Dungeon Master about this. All right, I'm gonna get up. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna do a little walk around the house here. Get the blood pumping. Maybe get something cold to drink. And uh, when we come back, we can finish up our workshop by drawing some information also from the party. 
and finding out what a party like this can bring to the table in other ways. Because I think we've already determined that for having for having two gnomes, two barbarians, two monks, and two criminals in a party, that we actually have a very cool concept. Because each of them overlap in their own ways. Kind of in a Venn diagram. What else can we determine by looking at each other's characters? Or if we don't know as, as players to hand the dungeon master our character sheets so that uh, she or he can plan these, you know, these bindings, these ups and downs and all arounds and, and things along those lines. Paisy says threat could be a reputation. Their bad rep as criminals combined with the reliance on outside forces means they'll have to somewhat pay, um, play knight towards authority. It almost sounds like a suicide squad they designed for themselves. And if that's how you want to play through it, absolutely. Absolutely you can. Sorry, mustache is getting a little... I'm getting some mustache aggro, everyone. I guess all the more reason for me to get up and, as Azrael says, take my health schlep. Uh, so, continue to think about this. I hope this has been inspirational and given you interesting ways that you can look at the at whatever party you're in if you're playing. As a dungeon master, you're running for him, or if you're in the party as a, as a player, try this exercise. Absolutely. And uh, when we come back, let's, let's find what else, what else, else can we draw from our party here that may seem redundant um, on the surface but is a lot deeper <laughs> 